So I'm the VP of RAN technology from AT&T. So how many of you know what RAN is? Just what does it stand for? I, I know I have some ringers in the room, so I, I won't let them answer. Radio access network. So close, close. Radio is the key. Um, but sometimes it feels random. Uh, I, I'll admit it. I, what's that? TDM. TDM, exactly. So I think what um, is important to remember is that the wireless network uh, that we use and leverage every day, what you guys expect is that it should work. It should work and not be random. Um, but that's, you know, sometimes I think we can't have what we want. Um, it was interesting to hear some of the other talks, and I thought about myself. I, you know, I put myself backwards in time uh, to when I was in school, and I was sitting there. I have three kids who are college age. Um, they're all in uh, Columbus, Ohio. Uh, two are studying at Ohio State University. Um, so I, I, I think also about my life and my experience. It was interesting to see Natalie's picture, because um, that team was working in Whippany, uh, I think, and then moved to Florham Park. And that was the year that I started at Lucent, so in 1998. So I'm sure I probably ran into some of the people that were in your picture. And I thought about the circle that's associated with my career. So I started my career in Lucent. So some of you may have heard of that company. It doesn't exist anymore. Uh, it was spun out from AT&T uh, back in 1996. So you know, for many of you, that was a long time ago, um, probably before you were born. So uh, I started there in 1998. Um, I went from Lucent. Lucent got acquired uh, by Alcatel uh, and became Alcatel Lucent. And Alcatel Lucent got acquired by Nokia and became Nokia. Um, I left uh, Nokia around 21 and went to work for a company called VMware. So one of the things I didn't enjoy was living through being an acquired company. It wasn't much fun. So something for you to think about in your career is that if you do get into a situation where the company is to be acquired, it's a natural pause point. Do I stay or do I go? So exactly that's what happened to me. Um, about 12 months after I started at VMware, they got acquired by Broadcom. And I said, OK, natural pause point. This is a time to think about doing something different. So whenever those things happen, it is good to think about where you're going as well as where do you want to be. Um, the funny thing for me is I said, OK, I'm going to leave classic telco. It's boring, right? Random access, radio access networks. OK, I've been working on that for 25 years. Even though for 25 years I was more or less doing what I considered to be the same thing, wireless system architecture, the name on the, on the front door kept changing. And I said, OK, I want to do something different. I want to jump into the cloud world. What I didn't recognize, and, and, and now I start to see a lot at AT&T, is, well, the cloud world has come to telco. I didn't really have to go anywhere. So believe it or not, in 22, I came back to a company which is quite strongly related to the company I started with at uh, AT&T. At and so I lead a team which is responsible for building all the technology with our partners. Uh, we work closely with a variety of suppliers uh, that goes largely at cell sites. How many of you have been to a cell site? How many of you know what a cell site is? So all the gear that goes from basically with the transport connection all the way to the tip of the antenna is specified, designed, tested, validated, certified by my team before it gets scaled into the network. You say to yourself, OK, but the scale is important. It's a very big scale, actually, that we deal with. And, and this is what drives us. In fact, this is the thing that's very difficult for me to even wrap my head around today. We think of it today that today we can handle or we reach 300 million people with our network. So some are on our network, some roam onto our network, and others um, uh, don't do either. But the big thing is, is the growth on the network continues to change every day. So we constantly see that new subscribers as well as old subscribers are consuming more data. It's hard to put in in volume terms, what does it mean to grow at a 26% rate? So how many of you know that rule about if you invest your money, how long does it take to double um, in seven years? What interest rate do you need to double your money? So you guys know about the compounding effect. So we have a compounding effect. So effectively, what we see is we double our network volume every two or three years. Can you imagine having to build a network? 
that doubles in volume every two or three years. It's incredible. The unfortunate thing is we don't get to charge more for it. You guys don't want to pay more for it, right? People just want to consume more. Uh, we're very happy about that, that people want to consume. It's a really good thing. But it creates a lot of technology challenges to say, how do you provide that experience that people need and people want um, with all these constraints? So for engineers who love constrained problems, that's what we focus on is, how do you manage to solve these very, very difficult constraint, constraining problems? So this is the great opportunity for us. And of course, the biggest thing to think about is that we covered a massive volume of data, roughly 700 petabytes a day. It's a very big volume of data. I, don't, I can't even wrap my head around that. When I started my career, um, I bought my first computer. Anybody want to guess how much memory was in my computer? Just, oh, you really think I'm old. <laughs> Um, I feel old sometimes. Thank you. Thank you. 16 megabytes. I had 16 megabytes worth of memory on my, in my computer. That was my excitement. I had to spend a lot of money to go from 8 to 16. Probably almost as much as what it would cost to buy a laptop today. But of course, I was running simulations on my computer. I was w working on it. And I said, I got to have 16 megabytes. It was very exciting to me. But here we are in the petabyte area. Uh, on a daily basis. The network is growing, and it's growing dramatically uh, for us. And again, you know, this is a tremendous engineering challenge of growing the network while turning down a lot of old things. Uh, the biggest challenge we have, of course, is, is the retirement of copper. Anybody in here have a traditional copper phone line, POTS phone line? One, two people. My 81-year-old mother won't let go of hers. She has a cable connection. She has a fiber connection. But she has to have an analog phone line. It's important to her. Why? Because she expects it to always work. I had an analog phone line from AT&T's competitor, the one up north. Don't know who that is. Um, every time it rained, it didn't work. So we're into a space now where it's hard to maintain a lot of the old and legacy technologies. So AT&T, because of its heritage, anyone know how old AT&T is? Anyone want to guess? I know there are ringers in here, so please don't answer if you work for AT&T. Anybody want to guess how old AT&T is? 50 years. 50 years. Yeah. What did you say? 140. 120. 120. <laughs> he is the closest. We're at 148 years. 148 years. So um, yeah, I mean, 148 years of innovation. But that also means that probably for the last 40 or 50 years, a lot of things are still running that were run, um, actually deployed or built or managed 40 or 50 years ago. I had the benefit or luxury of being able to take a tour of one of our buildings in downtown New York City. And they took us up to a floor, and they showed me a switch that was being discontinued by Lucent the year I started in 1998. And it was still carrying 8 million calls a day. 8 million. I said, what do you do with this switch? It runs 8 million calls a day. What actually, what traffic is that? Well, to be honest, it's mostly spammers. <laughs> so they used, and, and somehow there was a technology that was introduced that the spammers were able to take advantage of. And that's it. So we do try to block those calls. But finally, in the end, a lot of them, they get through. But the challenge, of course, is that we want to be, finally, the best connectivity provider um, in the US, maybe the world. Um, we definitely have a large scale. And we continue to grow. And we focus, as you heard before, on a combination of 5G and fiber. And very, very soon, we'll have 6G. Anybody know what 6G is? Again, no, no answers from the ringers. Yes. What do you think 6G is going to be? I think, I think the answer is we don't know yet. But I do believe that um, there will be a new service, and we'll call it 6G. The question is, is how fast will it be consumed, and who will consume it? Um, but for sure, I think you come to work for us. You come to work for my colleagues. There will be lots of opportunities to define the future of the network. We're actually trying to break the cycle a little bit on, on Gs, because 
frankly, what it's led to in many cases is not necessarily the best experience for us. In fact, we're constantly stuck in a cycle where we're trying to modernize and improve the network. We're constantly in a state of build. Um, my boss told me one day that he thought that we're not really a technology company. We're a construction company because we never stop building. We're always building, and you expect it. I mean, you want coverage where it isn't, and you want the coverage where it is to get better. That's what you expect. So we've been engaged in a pretty significant project. It's probably the largest one um, in AT&T history. We're basically going to every single cell site. Anyone guess how many cell sites we have? I, I don't know if I'm allowed to officially say that, but I, I can ask you guys if you know. Too many. No, not enough. Well, unfortunately, never enough. Anyone want to guess? This is a good scale question. By the way, it's similar uh, across us and our competitors. Roughly 70,000 uh, cell sites uh, to cover the US. But that translates to around 1.1 million radiating points. Can you imagine 1.1 million keeping track of, ensuring the integrity of the performance across 1.1 million radiators across the US? But we've started to uh, modernize the network. So we're going to go to every single site. Uh, we're going to upgrade uh, to improve our energy efficiency, try to take roughly a billion dollars out of our power bill on an annual basis. Also move us dramatically towards an open architecture. So for those in the room who are engineers, you, you hear open architecture, that probably excites you. Open source, um, people who hack in their basement, things like that. No, what we're really talking about is an ability to consume hardware and software from a variety of sources, not just exclusively from one company. So the old model, the company that I started with, Lucent, which developed everything from soup to nuts, is gradually being uh, replaced by a model where everything becomes disaggregated. Everything comes apart. And it comes from different companies. The benefit to um, the enterprise that deploys it is that we have a variety of options to choose from when we want to deploy. The benefit to the end user is what? Anyone guess? Wow, you guys are really on top of things, because that's exactly it. That's the first reason that everyone goes to an open architecture, is because they believe there will be ultimately a lower cost for the enterprise, which translates into a lower cost, finally, for the end user. At least that's what we hope. But finally, what it also does is it gives the opportunity for innovation. It gives an opportunity for others to contribute to all parts of the telco stack, as we call it. So we're looking at trying to do that and trying to change our network and essentially give us an opportunity to do new things with the network and monetize the network in a new way. Some of you probably heard of a company called Twilio, right? Have you heard of Twilio? So we want to be able to apply that effect. That's largely on uh, wireline connections on, with limited use. In some cases, it's used for multi-factor authentication, for um, uh, security and, and fraud protection, et cetera. But what we can really start to think about is a lot of APIs that might be available for other application providers. What they'll be able to do then with that could be very exciting. Um, uh, if you're willing to share your location, they could uh, provide you with information about who's available or uh, your friends that are available or finally other things that are available, but also be able to control groups of users and give them opportunities for unique experiences. So this gives us an opportunity by moving to open architectures to really start to unlock innovation cycles. And that's actually one of the challenges that we face is that today we see a lot of things moving at a much faster rate than the typical way that things work in the cellular network. So in the typical cellular network, uh, we upgrade on a 10-year cycle, on the G cycle. So we mentioned about 5G coming to 6G or becoming to 6G. But what we're noticing already is that artificial intelligence and then even spectrum, which is our lifeblood, where we radiate what frequencies, as well as cloud, they don't operate on these 10-year uh, clocks. So while cellular technology needs to be standardized and needs to be defined, in a reasonable way, what we do see, at least, is that we want to get a lot of these technologies integrated in the network without waiting for those big fork with forklift upgrades, um, which are interesting uh, to the consumer, but finally, in some cases, don't manifest in a lot of differences in terms of the way that things get deployed or experienced. So no talk today. Couldn't mention AI in some depth or breadth. And the origin of this slide, the author is actually here in the room. So I'll give him full credit. Malap is sitting over there. So if you have any questions about this slide, just ask Malak, and then I'll just skip it. I'm just kidding. 
So, but the simple thing that I wanted to just highlight to you is, is that AI is going to be for us in the access network at every level. It'll be in the in devices, it'll be at the cell sites, and then it'll be in regional and centralized locations. How many of you heard about Stargate? A few of you. So the regional locations are gonna be important, um, both inside AT&T's premise as well as outside of AT&T's premise. We're expecting that a lot of uh, work around AI will be aggregated in centralized areas. I don't know if they're gonna really spend um, $100 billion in Abilene, Texas. I hope they do. Maybe our taxes will go down. No? Joke? No. I'm still new to Texas. I moved here in, in September, so the, the taxes joke I haven't quite figured out yet. But I think you heard a little bit about you know, open architectures and what we're really trying to achieve. I think the bottom line is, is that we think that there's an opportunity. And again, this is a slide, and, and I feel like it's too busy. So I won't go through it because it's too busy. But to simply say that what we're really looking for right now is to start using and leveraging those open architectures to build a network which allows others to participate in it, to drive innovation. So if you come, join us, you can have the opportunity to start participating and developing the kinds of applications that might change the way that people think about using the network, um, but also optimize the way that the network actually uh, works. So lots of opportunity for all of you to participate at, at various levels. And I'm very excited to see the shining faces and remembering and thinking about myself sitting in that chair and thinking to myself, gosh, it's really getting long. He's the last speaker. Is it over yet? <laughs> okay, the good news is I am the last speaker. And the good news is I'm done. Um, there will be a panel discussion, but definitely if you want to chat more about what we're doing in the wireless access side of AT&T's network and uh, how you might fit in, or just in general about what it's like to be at AT&T. So despite working here, and I, I could definitely relate to Natalie, so I've only been here two years, but I don't feel like a two-year-old because I started with many of my colleagues in 1998, so I actually feel like I've been here well, I'm, I feel like I'm stealing your line, but I've actually been here uh, almost, yes, well, that'll be, what, 26 years, 27 years. So, um, again, thank you guys, and I guess I'll turn it back to Katie.